welcome everybody back into nerd sesh as always i'm carson brevin alongside me is logan camden and today we are going to be previewing this week five of nfl action that is coming up but first we're going to talk a little bit about justin fields because after an a abysmal abysmal first three weeks of the season he has had a real redemption arc these last couple weeks thrown for eight total touchdown passes and of course last night managed to get the chicago bears their first win in a long long time so what do you make of that logan are you back in on justin fields what has he proven to you I wasn't ever fully out on Justin Fields. I feel like when you have a ceiling like that with those athletic traits, when you can make such great things happen with your legs, there's always some sort of offense that you can build around Fields. And I thought that at Ohio State and even in the pros, we've seen that while Fields doesn't have the biggest arm, he's still capable of making downfield throws. Like, it's never been an issue of talent. It's been an issue of execution. And it is really encouraging these last two weeks. I mean, you see from the opening drive now – I do want to preface this with something in the Washington game. Wow, man. Washington's defense is pretty cheeks. I mean, they allowed yeah. a 30-piece uh, by the Broncos. You get piece by the, uh, like this by the Chicago defense. And I think this speaks really heavily to DJ Moore. What in masterclass. Even on those two, uh, the route running, the first go shot on the, uh, on the left side, it's more faking a crossing route, and then he cuts back outside that opens up uh, the split between the safety and the other corner uh, that allows Fields to get it in there. But I think Fields looks a lot more confident. I think they've simplified the game plan a little bit for him where he's making one to two reads and then mm -hmm. getting the ball out. It's really, really encouraging. And like we've been talking over the past couple of weeks, Carson, it's not a dramatic thing where it's going to happen rapidly, where Fields is just this fixed quarterback. It's going to take week to week making good throws, making slow progress. And I think we've seen that over the past two weeks. So I've never fully been out on Justin Fields, but these last two weeks really are encouraging that he could be something more. And I think it starts with the execution and using these really talented receivers the way they need to be used. Just feed him. DJ Moore's an awesome number one receiver. Give yeah. him the rock and let him go to work. You see what happens, man. You don't have to you don't have to overcomplicate the things, man. Get him into space, let him go to work. Now like I said, I don't know if Fields is going to have these kind of performances again the rest of the season. Again, he's done this against arguably two of the worst defenses in the National Football League. Yeah. I think the Broncos are the worst defense in the NFL, and the Commanders aren't far behind. Washington has an awesome front four. Uh, I love Jonathan Allen. I love Chase Young. I love all the guys up front. Their back seven is horrendous. So I don't know if we can say that Justin Fields is fixed. He looks a lot more confident. He looks poised in the pocket. Now, now that you've done this against two really bad defenses, I want him to. I want to see him do it against good defenses. But uh, these are certainly the best, two of the best games I've honestly ever seen Justin Fields play. And uh, DJ Moore does deserve a ton of credit uh, for what he did after the catch two in this game. They are Fields' two most prolific games as a passer. Mm -hmm. You said it. These are literally the two worst scoring defenses <laughs> in football that he has gone up against these past two weeks. But there's no doubt that he looks significantly better than through the first three weeks when he looked as though he had no business being out there as a starting quarterback. The accuracy was all over the place, but the most stark difference is just how overwhelmed he seemed by the mm -hmm. entire game, how incapable he was of going through his progressions, making his reads, making capable decisions with the football. I do think things have been significantly simplified, and I think... DJ Moore has been massive in making things easier on fields, on giving him that sort of first read option, who was making unbelievable plays, incredible route running, unbelievable contested catch making on that touchdown. Then you see the incredible yard after catch potential on DJ Moore's third touchdown of the game. He played an absolute masterclass. And of course, that was the vision of going out and acquiring him, getting a sort of number one guy who your young quarterback could actually rely on when the Bears had one of the most talentless receiving cores in football last year. And it hadn't had such a pronounced impact through three weeks, but these last two weeks, Fields has relied heavily on DJ Moore. This game, 230 of 282 yards passing mm. go to Moore. That is like almost unprecedented. And... Most of Fields' other completions on the day were really rudimentary checkdowns to dudes, but he is playing much better. 
he's doing a good job of just taking the first read, doing the simple stuff, but also letting it rip downfield when mm -hmm. it's there. And yeah, DJ Moore is pretty open on a few of these completions. And I do think that Fields still missed a couple dudes downfield. I don't worry about his arm strength. I do worry about his accuracy, though. And I thought that we saw that pose a few problems in this game. Like, of course, it's a pretty monster passing performance, but he's 15 of 29 in terms of completions on the day, and he did miss some throws he should have made, put too much loft on a ball that really should have been a touchdown to Darnell Mooney. The last more touchdown where he had that incredible run after the catch, very dangerous ball. DJ had to go up and get that thing. Looked like the DB had a very good chance to get a jump on it and make a play there. And he also missed on some short passes in this game. So I'm still worried about his accuracy. I'm still not blown away by his ability to work through his progressions and read the field. But he's certainly been better. He faced a lot of pressure in this game. I do think sometimes he holds on to the ball for too long, but he's done a better job there in the last couple weeks. And really this Bears line just is not good. So he's still playing in a relatively adverse situation, but I think the play calling has been better, made his job easier, and DJ Moore has been out of this world. So I need to see more from Fields as a pocket passer, making some more high-level throws against legitimate defenses, consistently making good decisions with the football for multiple game stretches to buy on him as some sort of franchise guy. Mm -hmm. But I was really, really discouraged after three mm -hmm. weeks. I was all in on, this just isn't working. He wasn't in a good offensive situation, but he was so individually awful in a vacuum that it seemed to me like you're going to be maybe the worst team in football if you get a top pick, invest in a quarterback again. And now I think that the jury is out again on fields. Well, I think that's the big question moving forward. You know, the Bears right now, again, projected to have the top two picks in the draft. So it's a question of what do you do with the pick? Is Fields going to turn it around? I, I think whoever has the number one pick is foolish if they pass on Caleb Williams. Like if Fields yeah. no, ends agreed. up, if they have the record to get that pick, I say you go ahead and you pull the trigger and you just take him. But that is going to be the question that we're going to have to monitor the rest of the season. You know, do you give him another season? Do you let him go? Do you try to trade him? What happens? I do think one more encouraging thing that I think we saw in this game, Carson, was that Fields looked like he didn't hesitate to use his legs that often, too. Yeah. Uh, he had been, uh, in weeks previous, just stick around in the pocket, hold on to the football. Fields isn't a traditional pocket passer, and I think to use him like that is a fundamental yeah. misstep of his talents. You know, you want to maximize his own abilities, and I think he's been... Uh, a little more ready to go and use his legs, and that's how you really yeah. maximize a guy like that. So I think you're right. We're going to have to see more the rest of the season, but this is Justin Fields. <laughs> He's fighting for his job the rest of this year, man. That's what's on the line. Yeah, and I totally agree on the willingness to use his legs. That is what has the potential to make him special. That's why there's so much excitement about him down the home stretch of last year. He was a historically mm -hmm. great running quarterback. But you're absolutely right about the likelihood of them getting the top pick because I don't know who looks worse right now, them or the Panthers, but there's a real chance that it's one of those two who finishes with the worst mm -hmm. record in football. But props to the Bears for finally getting a win. Props to Fields for looking much better after a brutal start to the year. Okay, now let's look ahead to the biggest game of this upcoming weekend, Logan, because we have a real showdown in the NFC between the Cowboys and the Niners. What are you expecting from this game? I'm expecting this to be a really competitive game. I mean, I think these are two of the top three teams in the NFC. Cowboys have yet to play anybody. Uh, they played the Giants, the Jets, the Cardinals, and the Patriots. Obviously, they drop one to the Cardinals. Pretty close game. 12 points doesn't really reflect how tightly Dallas played them. Uh, they outgained them offense uh, in terms of total yards. They had opportunities to score points to win that game. But they dominated every other team. I mean, they 40-piece the Giants. Uh, they beat the mm -hmm. Jets by 20. They decimate the Patriots. So this is Dallas's first true test. And I think the Niners are going to win. And if I had to pick, I'd probably say the Niners win by a touchdown. And the reason I say that is I just think that there's so much more faith that I have in the Niners' offense to create the, mm -hmm. the cleverness of the offense. I just don't think that it's something that you can take away. Uh, Mark Sanchez had an awesome breakdown on the herd the other day, breaking down the Niners offense, how they use pre-snap motion, how they use Kyle Juszczyk. We've talked about it in depth, the running starts that you get, 
uh, mm -hmm. from tight ends, from Yuzchuk, the clever runs, and most importantly, the deception from everybody, from the pulling guards, from Purdy. It's honestly one of the best offenses I've ever seen, and I think that we keep getting caught up, Carson, and crowning Miami as the best offense in football. I still think that we need to have San Francisco, Buffalo yeah. in those conversations. Like, we want to crown Miami because they dropped 70 points on a team, but I still think that there's a tier one of offenses, and San Francisco firmly yes. deserves to be in that conversation because of how dominant McCaffrey is as a runner, because of how great this offensive line is, because of how clever the offense is, and because of all the requisite receiving talent. To me, Carson, we were looking at an individual one-game matchup between these two teams. Again, they're super talented. The thing that's going to come down for me is finishing drives, is scoring points, and that is where the Dallas Cowboys have ultimately faltered still through the early stages. They are 30th in terms of red zone percentage. In 19 trips to the red zone, they have seven touchdowns. When you look at San Francisco, they have 18 trips. They have 12 touchdowns. That's really the only difference that I need to look at that is going to make this distinction for me. Both of these teams great on third downs. They're going to keep drives alive. It's about who's going to finish these drives, and I just don't trust Dallas to finish them. Dak Prescott has struggled to put the ball in the end zone. That's going to make a big difference to me, man, and that's what I'm looking for in this football game. If Dallas can finish drives, I think they can win a Super Bowl. If they can't, if this is still their Achilles heel, it's what's going to limit them in the playoffs. So the outcome really isn't as important to me. Again, in one-game settings against two talented teams, a lot of factors come into the outcome. I just want to see Dallas finish drives, put the ball in the end zone. That's mm -hmm. where I want to build confidence and show me that this isn't going to be a hole. This isn't going to be an issue the rest of the season. That's where I really struggle to buy into Dallas as a football team. So I'm going to take San Francisco, I'd say, by give me four and a half points. You think that they're going to win by four and a half points? That's my line. That's my line. What are you taking? <laughs> okay. That's your line. I think that that's a good line. I believe the official line right now is three and a half. So you're close to it. And I also maybe like the Niners a little bit more than the consensus here. These teams are both loaded in terms of talent, both sides of the ball. And they absolutely have to be among the top three teams in the NFC. Mm -hmm. But I do think the Niners are more complete. I do think that they are more without holes. And I do like them in this matchup because of that. This is an incredibly balanced offense, but it's been a really dominant rushing attack. Mm -hmm. Christian McCaffrey is on pace to have a historically great season if he can keep this up. And the Cowboys really have not defended the run well thus far. I think the totality of these defenses, both of them are loaded up front. They both have really imposing pass rushes with one of the premier pass rushers in football leading it all, Nick Bosa. And then, of course, you have Micah Parsons. They have a really good pass rusher alongside them, Javon Hargrave, Demarcus Lawrence. They're loaded units. But I think if you look at the totality of the defense, the linebackers, I significantly prefer the Niners. I think that mm -hmm. the Cowboys playing a lot of those single high safety looks do have potential to get burnt by an explosive passing attack like the Niners. They just haven't faced that offense yet. And they did struggle to stop the Cardinals, which was honestly the most capable offense they've faced so far. And then when I look at the quarterback position, I have more confidence in Brock Purdy yeah, to play mistake-free football than Dak right now, to just execute the offense. And I think that's what the Niners need. Brock Purdy is playing that perfect facilitator role. He is controlling the game. He's making good decisions. He's accurate. Dak is still sort of trying to get fully in sync. He's had some real up and down stretches through these first four games. So I think the Niners are better coached. I think they're more complete on both sides of the ball. I do think this will be a good test for Brock Purdy facing a pass rush of this caliber, but he gets the ball out pretty damn fast. He's seventh in terms of time to throw among starters. He processes the field so quickly. He can rely heavily on that run game. I think he'll hold up relatively mm -hmm. well, and this offense is going to scheme a brilliant game. Purdy held up pretty well against that Steelers pass rush in week one. I do think the Cowboys pass rush is slightly more imposing because it's really really elite but the Steelers is pretty damn good too so you mentioned the situational edge that's meaningful to me too the Cowboys haven't been good at finishing drives I think that Kyle Shanahan has a real edge over Mike McCarthy these are both loaded teams on paper but when I look at the spots that matter most coaching the totality of the defense the formula to reliably elite offense with just how balanced San Francisco is and how composed Purdy has been consistently. 
they just check more boxes to me. So I also like them. And they're my Super Bowl favorite right now. Same, dude. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, I mean, the Niners to me are my number one team in all of football. I think oh, I did my power rankings last week. I wrote it out. I'd probably go, give me your top three. I got San Francisco, Buffalo, and then I think, I think Kansas City probably just because of Mahomes. Yeah, I would still put Philly into that same top tier. Okay. They may not have consistently played at the same level as last year, but I believe so much in the talent there on paper. I think they are as loaded as the Niners. They just haven't played quite at the level that the Niners have so far. But really the only thing holding me back from crowning the Niners as the mm -hmm. Super Bowl favorite before the year was what level of quarterback play are they going to get? And of course... I think Purdy proved to us last year that he was solid over that mm -hmm. seven game sample size that we got with him as a starter. But through another four weeks, I have been even more impressed and I just don't see him as an element that can hold them back. Like I do believe that dynamic creation from the quarterback spot really matters. And Purdy is certainly not in that top tier in that respect, but this team is so stacked they are so uniquely capable of just getting the ball to their weapons in space and those dudes can carry the load they are so good on the ground and they're so loaded defensively i just think this might be the exception where they don't need elite quarterback play to mm -hmm. win it all they just need good quarterback play and they are getting that from brock purdy and one final thing on the niners that i uh want to say that's so remarkable dude is it's like they can have one guy disappear week to week, and they are yes. just still so loaded in the talent areas. Like, George Kittle, week to week, right? Like, one game, he'll catch one pass for 15 yards. But yeah. Ayuk's going for a buck 20. Debo's got 90. McCaffrey's got 100 on the ground. Next week, you know, Ayuk was out one week. Doesn't matter. Kittle steps up immediately. Yeah. 11 catches for over 100. It's it's insane the amount of, of talent that San Francisco has. And I, I feel the exact same way, Carson, that if Brock Purdy can just steer the ship traditionally, right, NFL history, star quarterbacks lead to uh, to success, you know, continued success, I really mm -hmm. do think San Francisco is the exception to, to the rule. And that's no shot at Brock Purdy. But yeah, I 100% believe the Niners can win a Super Bowl with that kid, man. I do too. And to take what you're saying even one step further, last week they had two dudes disappear. Debo Samuel and George Kittle, these all pro caliber players at their peaks a couple years ago, they combined for nine yards last week and the Niners hung 35 points because McCaffrey was that overwhelmingly dominant on the ground and as a receiving option, Ayuk was incredible and that dude is so damn good. There is nobody that has four skill position players of this talent level with a line like this, with coaching like this, with a quarterback playing this consistently, efficiently. They are really a well-oiled machine, and this will be a good test playing a team of this caliber, but I think they hold up better than the Cowboys here. The NFL season is going strong, and DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking new customers up with an offer that's even stronger. Bet 5 bucks on any game this week to score $200 instantly in bonus bets. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of a sweetener offer every game day this October. Get in on the game day greatness. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code NERDS. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets when you bet five on the NFL. That's code NERDS only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. And speaking of Brock Purdy, there's a guy who last year as a rookie quarterback coming out of nowhere, balled out far beyond expectations. But there were three very high-profile rookie quarterbacks selected in this year's draft. So now that we've seen a few weeks of all of them, Logan, let's do a little check-in. How would you rank the trio of Stroud, Anthony Richardson, and Bryce Young? And what have you seen from those guys? I still feel the way that I felt in the pre-draft process and at the start of the year. Uh, I had Stroud as my number one. I, I like Stroud's, one, just his frame a lot more than Bryce Young's. I I know that we can tend to overstate those things, but it really is remarkable when you look through the scope of NFL history at quarterbacks. There's not a lot of guys who are that small, who are yeah. shorter than six foot. And again, I, I think it's a little bit overplayed. There are exceptions to the rule. You look at Drew Brees, you look at Russell Wilson. Uh, I think of some mobile quarterbacks that were uh, exceptions to the rule, Michael Vick, but like even Vick, Vick was six foot flat and he had an absolute cannon of a left arm. You know, there's... 
There's guys that, that definitely can be exceptions, but it, it is true. You look at a guy like Tua, who's smaller. Those hits, it matters, man. Bryce Young, you see it early. When you're taking hits from guys who are 300 pounds, you just have to have a minimum frame, one, to take those hits, but also you have to be strong enough and confident enough in your body and yourself to stay in the pocket and take those licks. That's why I had Stroud as an edge over him. We also saw Stroud in big games that mattered too, and I just think we've seen that. Stroud is really, really composed in the pocket. He's got an awesome arm. There's times where he's a little bit inaccurate, but I mean, compared to the other guys, I mean, he's just on a different level of of composed. And yeah. I don't think Stroud overcomplicates things. I think he does a really good job of hanging in the pocket. I think him and Nico Collins have a really, really special connection yeah. already. And that's been the thing to me too is I don't know what they're doing in Houston. I really believe in this offensive line up front around him too. They've been beat up and it hasn't mattered. Whoever they've put in front of Stroud, they've really protected him and bought him time. Uh, Stroud, to me, has been far and away the number one guy through the season, and that's how I felt uh, coming into the draft. Second, I would have Anthony Richardson, and we talk about in terms of ceiling, and in comparison to Bryce Young, too, Carson. Again, I just think Richardson is built to hang up, man. That guy's a tank. He's composed in the pocket. I think there's so many things you can do with him on the ground, and I think that he's just going to continue to get better. Long term, I do have concerns about his accuracy. That's what's going to turn him from average quarterback middle of the pack that can make explosive plays to a cam newton sort of mvp level quarterback because to me richardson and him richardson has that same kind of janky cam arm release that i don't Mm -hmm. really like it's a weird shoulder roll where i'm like that's funky looking it works but it's a little janky it's a little hitchy and then Bryce, man, I don't know if bryce is the guy and bryce is in by far to me the worst situation out of all these guys I want to make something abundantly clear. I think Indianapolis and Houston are good football teams. I don't think they're great. I don't think they're playoff contenders. I think both of them are good. I think Carolina sucks. I think it's by far the worst situation out of all these young QBs. I think the offensive line is the worst. I think the weapons are probably the worst still out of all these guys. And so I think that Stroud definitely is coming from the the lowest place trying to drag these guys to contention, but... He's small. He's a little panicky. He still makes good decisions, but he doesn't make as many downhill throws as the other two guys. That's probably the biggest edge that I'd give to Stroud over both of these guys, man. Stroud doesn't care. He will fit balls into windows. He will throw it downfield. Like, mm-hmm. like that was something. I, we didn't talk about this in the Bears-Commanders game. As, as shitty as I think Sam Howell is, 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 as much of a cap and a ceiling that I put on Sam Howell, Sam Howell, Howell can throw the ball into windows and will force it downfield. Stroud does the same thing, but on a different level. Mm-hmm. Bryce hasn't really shown me that he can do that yet, and that's what I want to see. I want to see a different level of composure, and I want to see that Bryce can really fit the ball downfield and throw into tight windows. I'm not out on Bryce Young by any means, but I certainly have the biggest amount of red flags with him, man. I think that Stroud and Richardson, Stroud's a franchise guy. Richardson is going to be a starter for a few years before I can make a distinction. Bryce, I really don't know if he's a guy that I can bank in on for the next three to four years yet. I also have Stroud number one, and I feel pretty strongly about that. And it's hilarious. I'm looking at my notes that I wrote down, and I didn't realize I did this, but I wrote real MF and deal for him twice. I started with that, and I ended with that. And I think that represents how I feel about CJ Stroud, dude. I have been really, really impressed. I think he's a very good decision maker with the football, really accurate thrower, and good job of staying composed, even under pressure. You give props to the patchwork line. I think they've played better the last couple weeks, but the first two weeks, it was pretty brutal. He was facing a lot of pressure consistently, Mm -hmm. and I thought that he still held up pretty well. And he's selective but effective with his Mm. legs. Mm. Yeah, wow. I'm (laughs) cooking today. I'm cooking today. didn't even realize that was going to be so nice when I said it. But he does have more creation to me. Not only does he have a better frame than Bryce Young, I do think that he is more athletically capable of making big plays. And the production, we're only looking at a four-week sample size, but it's outstanding. I mean, he's fourth in passing yards out of dudes who have only played four games. He's third in yards per attempt. As a rookie, 
behind just Tua and Purdy, who are both in literal offensive heaven, elite weapons, brilliant coaches, incredibly balanced offenses, capable of dominating with the run too. And then you have rookie Stroud, who entered a situation with a beat up line with totally unproven weapons. And I do like Nico Collins, but he hadn't produced, mm -hmm. hadn't had a 500 yard season before this year. Tank Dell was unproven. Like, it's incredibly impressive what he's done, and I don't want to rewrite the situation because I didn't think the Texans were going to be a good football team. I thought they would take a step forward. I thought they'd win like six games. Maybe I liked them a bit more than Carolina. I didn't think that there was some major gap. So Stroud is so impressive. He's been one of the most explosive passers in football plays of 20 plus yards, 40 plus mm -hmm. yards. I think that speaks to his willingness to put the his willingness to push the ball downfield, his accuracy and touch there. He's number one for me, but I do really like Anthony Richardson too. We are still seeing inconsistency with the accuracy, mm -hmm. which is obvious. A guy who had the limited experience as a starter that he did, who had the accuracy issues, the mechanical inconsistencies, there is no way to overhaul that in year one and suddenly be a super refined, efficient passer. So that was a given. He's still missing dudes high. He's sort of spraying the ball all over the field this past week, I thought was probably his roughest in terms of accuracy, but... The stuff you buy into with Anthony Richardson, the upside has been remarkable. It's not just what he's doing with his legs, which is super impressive. And I think he's one of the most gifted rushing quarterbacks we've seen with that combination of size and power at his and speed. But you see the raw arm talent, the touchdown throw to Mo Alley Cox this past week, utterly ridiculous as he's falling down from that sort of sideways arm angle, just lets it rip. That is unbelievable raw talent. He has a throw 30-something yards downfield to Pierce. As he is being hit by Aaron Donald, he can't get his legs into the throw at all. He doesn't have any room to step up. Like, that is just crazy, crazy arm talent. He had the two-point conversion right after that first crazy touchdown throw where just an amazing job of evading the pass rush and creating a play where 90% of NFL quarterbacks just couldn't. And I was impressed by his mental composure to come back from down 23 nothing. So, yeah, he's had a boneheaded moment or two. He's had some accuracy issues. But for the most part, he has been reasonably good at making decisions. He has been able to mostly do the basic stuff, with some exceptions. And then you see the, like, really outstanding raw talent pop. So we're going to need to see more consistency from him. We're going to need to see how he develops in terms of his polish as a passer. But I definitely buy into the talent more than I do with Bryce, who I thought from the jump was a very low ceiling number one mm -hmm. pick. But I was certainly impressed by his composure, his accuracy, his mobility within the pocket, his footwork. I just thought this is a very solid guy. And he just looks overwhelmed right now. He's not in a good situation. His weapons are super limited. He's behind a bad line. So... That's tough when your line can't protect and your receivers can't separate. But he has these moments. This past week, still tried to throw a screen that the lineman had just absolutely jumped. Could have been a pick six kind of moment. Still throws that ball. Inexcusable. It doesn't really look like he's throwing a good ball right now. Mm -hmm. Also, he's throwing some wobbly, inaccurate balls. And he is just having to be so, so bad babied right now really within this mm -hmm. offense i mean 12 of his 25 completions were behind the line of scrimmage man it is let's get the ball out of his hands as fast as possible let's make this as easy as possible and there's a very low ceiling with that so he is the most limited athlete he doesn't offer mm -hmm. the creation outside the pocket that the other two dudes do to me he doesn't have a pocket presence composure accuracy edge over stroud i think that stroud is mm -hmm. kicking his ass in all three of those categories so his situation is not good, but within a vacuum, he has been the least impressive of these three, clearly. I'm not going to give up on the guy. It's super early in his career. It's a rough spot to look good. But again, the other two dudes, I mean, if you were looking at preseason expectations, it wasn't that different mm -hmm. between the Texans and the Colts and the Panthers. And if you look at the Colts receiving core, like Michael Pittman is a low-end number one. Outside of that, it was a really unimpressive receiving core those dudes are making it work they're playing above expectations and bryce young is playing below expectations and he looks like he's sort of shriveling up in this situation right now hey man and i'll point it out who did they have in their quarterback that kind of balled out that made the panthers look competitive andy dalton look man if you, can't, 
the Red Rocket, man. If you can't convincingly beat out Andy Dalton, who's I think forty now, I cannot. I didn't even know he was still in the league until he popped up for that game, he's man. He's not forty. Yeah, he's forty, <laughs> man. No, he's not. He was just starting so fast. He was on playoff teams. Couldn't win a playoff game, but from the jump. But that to me is really remarkable too, man. When Andy Dalton's making this offense look competent and competitive, I need to see a step up. But like I said, I don't think there's. I think you're right. It's not time to throw in the towel on Bryce Young yet. We'll let him play out this season, but by far to me, dude, as the far as to go, I can definitely see Stroud and Richardson as franchise guys, and I think you're exactly right about Richardson too, man. We think about the young prototypes that we compared him to uh, in you know years previous that have come out. The guys who were really raw, Josh Allen, Cam Newton, yeah. Ben Roethlisberger, the guys with those kind of athletic profiles. I don't think Ben's in the running category of those two, but you get what I'm saying with the arm talent. Yeah, Lamar Jackson's another one who comes to my mind where it was super raw arm talent, but mm-hmm. inaccurate, and he struggled with that and his rookie year too. I still think Lamar's a criminally underrated arm talent, too. I think still yes. some people like underrate how, like, how big of an arm Lamar yes. has. So... I think there's a huge ceiling with Richardson. Like, if he can build on this, and that's why you buy in on the guys like this. Now, there's a difference, right? Because in certain drafts, oh, Jamarcus Russell can throw a ball 80 yards from his knees, right? Like, there's some things that don't matter, but there's just a difference in, like you said, dude, ceiling. I never really yeah. bought into Bryce Young's ceiling. To me, his ceiling would be a Russell Wilson, a Drew Brees, where those guys are surgical. Like, you know what I mean? I well, don't Drew even... Brees is pretty good. So is Russ. Well, I mean, you're looking at two of the most, yeah, I'm saying with those physical profiles, Mm -hmm. you're looking at guys who are the smartest in the NFL. They're throwing balls pinpoint into tight Mm -hmm. windows that are dissecting coverages. I'm not saying that Bryce doesn't have the brain for that, but you're looking for guys to play fundamentally perfect football. It's just a lot harder to ask a guy who are that limited in terms of arm strength, you know? So... It, it, I'm definitely not selling my stock on Bryce Young, but he's he's in a different tier to me than those two guys. I buy into Stroud and Richardson as bona fide franchise QBs. All right, well, Bryce Young may be struggling, but nobody is having a harder go at mm. it so far this mm-hmm. year than Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals, man. They miraculously have won a football game, but... Do you think they can win another and beat the Cardinals this week? And if not, is it time to shut down Joe Burr? Joe Burr? (laughs) I didn't roll my R there. It sounded very weird. Joe Burr. Yeah, man. I I said last week that I definitely think they should explore that, and I learned something too. The guy who got them to their closest uh, attempt at winning a playoff game pre-Joe Burrow, A.J. McCarron, is back on the practice squad. Uh, A.J. McCarron's last actual... uh, Football action was in the XFL with the St. Louis Battle Hawks. I would play A.J. McCarron, man. Look, it's not like you're going to have a high ceiling. You're not going to the playoffs. You are effectively throwing into the towel uh, at the end of, you know, for the rest of the year if you put Joe Burrow on ice and put A.J. McCarron in, right? You're giving up. I think that's what you should do because I, I don't think they win this football game. I would not pick yeah. the Cincinnati Bengals to win this game. I think the Cardinals are a good football team. They're not great, but I don't think they're in the basement, you know, at the bottom of the barrel the way we thought coming into this season. I think the Cardinals are going to win this game, man. Like, I trust this defense. They've had a really effective – they've had a pretty effective pass defense so far. They've made some big plays. They have a decent pass rush. They're not great, and I think this is going to be a grimy game, but Joe Burrow has shown us that they can't move the ball at all. I think the Bengals have – Two total offensive touchdowns this season. They've got one of the highest three and out rates of any team in the NFL this season. It's, yeah, I would not pick the Bengals to win this football game. They've just shown me nothing. This offensive line has sucked. They've bought no time for Joe Burrow in the pocket. I read off some of these stats last week when we talked about Joe Burrow. He's got the lowest yards per attempt through the start of a season for any quarterback ever. When you look at any quarterback through four games in NFL history, He has the 13th lowest yards per attempt. He's not healthy. His knee is shot. This offensive line sucks. And again, when you have paid a guy this much money, the last thing that you want to do is tear him up even further. If they lose this game, Carson, I don't think you have an option. I think you throw in the towel. You go and you get yourself a high draft pick. You let A.J. McCarron come in here and rock, or you let Jake Browning show us if he's an NFL quarterback. 
You go out, you get yourself a high draft pick. It's a harsh reality, especially for a team that has been so competitive over the past few years. You get a Super Bowl appearance. You were in the AFC title game. I think that's what you have to do. Carson, do you think the Bengals lose this game, and do you think they should shut down Joe Burrow? Unless Burrow's calf is better this Mm -hmm. week, which I don't really expect it to be, I don't think that the Bengals beat the Cardinals. I think that Arizona has moved the ball so much more reliably this season. They have a great running game to rely on. They've been second in yards per attempt. They have an efficient quarterback in Josh Dobbs who can make plays outside the pocket, who is going to limit his mistakes. And they're playing a Bengals defense that has really, really regressed. They aren't getting pressure at all. They're 26th in pressure rate. They have the number 30 run defense in yards per attempt. Matches up beautifully with the Cardinals' strength. I think the secondary has regressed, losing Jesse Bates, losing Von Mm -hmm. Bell. And as you mentioned, Cincinnati has had the worst offense in football. Burrow cannot move around in the pocket. He can't plant properly, Mm -hmm. so he can't make the sort of throws that he's used to. He is playing as one of the worst starting quarterbacks in the NFL right now because he is so hampered here. The line is not playing well. I haven't liked the play calling, but as we talked about last week, it's dangerous to have him out there. It's stupid, and it's not even good for you to win football games because he is playing Mm -hmm. at such a poor level. And of course, there's... No run game for him to rely on. They're one of the worst rushing attacks in football. So this Arizona defense has had its issues. It's not a particularly imposing pass rush at all. That's a weakness there. I don't think it's a very strong defensive unit anywhere, but I think that they're well coached. I honestly like what Jonathan Gannon is doing there, and I think that we got to maybe start betting on dudes who are weirdos in the preseason <laughs> press conferences and pep talks of their teams, especially if they're affiliated with the Eagles because Sirianni was a freak. Mm-hmm. Jonathan Gannon was a <laughs> lame speaker, but they can cook up a little something on the football field. I just think they're a better football team. In- until I see Joe Burrow healthier, Joe Burrow revitalized, Joe Burrow looking like himself – The Bengals are not a good football team. They are deeply, deeply flawed. And the thing that is supposed to be able to patch that up, cover up their other flaws, and still make them a good football team is this elite passing attack. But you need Joe Burrow to be able to go beyond his first read, to be able to move around comfortably in the pocket, extend plays, make the throws that he's used to. Otherwise, that collapses and the team collapses. And that's what's happened. I don't really see reason that that would change. And yes... If they start one and four and Joe Burrow is still this clearly impaired and hampered, to me, your season's over. It sucks. It's frustrating. You don't want either Jake Browning or AJ McCarron out there, especially when you have a lot of win now talent you've invested in, especially at the receiver position and you're a team with Super Bowl expectations. But it doesn't justify putting your $500 million Mm -hmm. quarterback in danger just because he wants to go out there and compete. Of course he wants to. I've seen some people use that as an excuse, like, well, Burrow wants to play. Of course he wants to play. He's a competitor. But it's your job as the organization to make an assessment of, does the reward outweigh the risk here? And it very, very clearly has not so far. Because this can get worse than a calf injury, Mm -hmm. man. He gets blown up because he can't move around in the pocket. Things can get uglier than just him prolonging this injury that in itself maybe isn't such a big long-term concern. So I think they're in a really bad spot. I would not pick them. I don't think they should be favored by three on the road, which is what the line is at DraftKings. I'm really worried about the Bengals. When I was talking to you, Carson, actually before the show started about a a Bengals quarterback from long ago, pre-70s, Greg Cook, one offensive rookie of the year, man. He played... Uh, his next season with a separated shoulder. Now, this is back in the 70s when uh, sports medicine and stuff is pre, uh, pretty mm-hmm. primitive, so it was a lot harder for him to come back, but the premise is still the same here. The guy is hurt. He's not playing at 100%. This season doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> it's so hard to come back from this whole dude. You're exactly yeah. right. I, I don't want to see this guy get hurt, and it can only get worse from here, dude. And honestly... Like you said, dude, can this offense really be worse with a like with a a hundred percent healthy QB in here? I don't really think it can be, man. Uh, please, for Joe's sake, just just give it up. Also, Zach Taylor, run a ninth play. He has like eight plays in this playbook. Man. <laughs> Vary it up a little bit, buddy. 
I love the Greg Cook reference, man. Look at that deep embedded knowledge of football history you get there from Logan. 75 years old, this guy is in his heart. <laughs> Let's take a quick break to talk about Verizon's new offer. For a limited time, Verizon customers can get Netflix and NFL Plus for just $25 a month with Plus Play. That's $120 in annual savings. Plus Play is a platform where Verizon customers can shop, manage, and save on the subscriptions they already love, like Netflix and NFL Plus. With NFL Plus Premium, you get access to live games on mobile, NFL Red Zone, and NFL Network, and more. Just go to verizon.com slash plus play to bundle and save on Netflix and NFL Plus today for a limited time only. Another team that not so long ago was in the Super Bowl against the Cincinnati Bengals, Logan, the LA Rams. Expectations were pretty low for this year after just a brutal 2022 campaign, but they're sitting at 2-2. Two and two. Do they have upset potential versus the Eagles this week? Uh, definitely they have upset potential against the Philadelphia Eagles, primarily because of this prolific passing attack. Uh, mm -hmm. The Eagles right now rank 30th uh, against the pass, defending it, and that's where... Obviously, the Rams shine. Cooper Cup rumored to maybe be back this week. You pair up Cooper Cup with Puka Nakua, Tutu Atwell, Tyler Higby. Like, this could be an explosive passing attack. And again, yeah. you remember the Thursday night football. That was a weird game, Kirk Cousins versus the Eagles. Kirk lights them up for four TDs, over 300 yards passing through the air. They had virtually no running game. So I don't think that matters against uh, Philadelphia. And also, too, that's a six-point game where Minnesota had four turnovers, man. They were fumbling all over the field. Yeah. The Vikings kept that game close, and they didn't play great defensively either. My one concern for L.A. in this matchup is their offensive line. I think Philly could eat them alive there in the trenches. This is such a ferocious pass rush. Uh, even guys that we don't normally talk about, right? We normally give shout-outs to Brandon Graham, to Fletcher Cox, to Jalen Carter, uh, to Jordan Davis, right? We give shout-outs to those guys. I want to give a shout out to Josh Sweat and Nicholas Morrow, bro. Other guys on this uh, pass rush that are just as dangerous. This is still a ferocious, ferocious pass rush. That's where I think that if they get home, because this is a bad Los Angeles offensive line, mm -hmm. they could blow this game up and blow LA out. But considering how poor Philly's been against the pass and how successful Matthew Stafford has been this season in spite of his offensive line, I think this is going to make this game pretty competitive. Eagle, the Eagles have struggled to put teams away all season long, so yeah. I don't know why I'd anticipate this game being any different. Obviously, I think Philadelphia is a bona fide Super Bowl contender, but I think this is going to be a really competitive game. I wouldn't take the Rams to win, but I think I think Matthew Stafford can make this pretty close, especially if Cooper Cup is back and close to 100%. Mm -hmm. I think this game could be really interesting. It is an interesting matchup because the Rams have overachieved a bit up to this point, our expectations. And the Eagles, despite sitting at 4-0, have underwhelmed. Like you mentioned, they only really have one decisive victory on the season. Other than that, it's been too close for comfort. I do think that the passing defense numbers for them are a bit misrepresentative just because they've still been up in most of these mm -hmm. games so they're facing teams that are throwing the ball a lot and they've been willing to play some softer coverage just to try to prevent the one explosive mm -hmm. play so i do think opposing qbs have been able to pad their stats a bit in that respect i think this is a really good all-around eagles defense still but the rams have been pushing the ball downfield through the air they are very very reliant on matt stafford in this mm -hmm. passing game but we have seen the diamonds in the rough with Tutu Atwell and Puka Nakua. We have seen Matt Stafford really play pretty darn well, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, his arm is certainly still there. I think he is still able to make big-time throws. He pushes the ball downfield. The thing that has bit him in this Rams offense so far has just been the mistakes. I think that he's had that one or two throw a game that kills you the interception that bites you that has kind of been his achilles heel throughout mm -hmm. much of his career if he plays mistake free football then yeah i think the rams do have some upset potential here it's been a pretty good offense 12th in yards per play it's been a solid defense 15th in yards per play allowed and cup regardless of what you think of puka nakua should elevate this passing attack as a high-end number one 
But I still just think Philly's formula is certainly more reliable. It's a dominant rushing attack. I'm just waiting for Hertz to click into gear and play better than he has through four weeks. I absolutely believe it's there with the receiving talent, with his efficiency as a passer last season. This is a dominant pass rush that I do think can eat the Rams O-line alive. The Rams haven't been a very good run defense. Plays into Philly's strength, that dominant, dominant line. So... If Matt Stafford plays a great football game, then yeah, there's the potential, but they are pretty singularly reliant on that because they haven't run the ball super well. There's not a single unit on this defense that really pops out to me. They've just sort of been okay. And the Eagles better keep winning games like this mm-hmm. because they should get to 6-0 and after the next two weeks because then they have maybe the toughest eight game stretch on any schedule I've ever seen. They go dolphins at commanders. That's the one that should be a convincing win, but that was a pretty tight game when they played this past week. Then Cowboys at chiefs bills, Niners at Cowboys at Seahawks. You are playing four of the top six teams in football there and other legit playoff teams like the Seahawks. You have to play the Cowboys twice. I mean, it's just a ridiculous stretch. So I still buy into the Eagles, but they need to snap into peak Mm -hmm. form pretty soon. Probably not this week. They can probably get away with another subpar game and still beat the Rams. This is going to be maybe a bit more of a test than some of the just inferior teams they've played so far. But they're going to be tested for real in the second half of this regular season. And then is when we'll really see what they're made of. All right, last thing real quick, Logan. Give me a score prediction. Give me the bullet points for Steelers-Ravens this week. Uh, I'll go... uh, Normally, we play Lamar Jackson pretty well. This is actually an interesting matchup, Carson. I think the Steelers have only played Lamar as the starter three times, despite him being there this long, because he always manages to be hurt Mm -hmm. when we play him. Dodging, ducking the matchup. 27-13, Ravens. Okay. Matt Canada, just, Matt Canada is too busy twiddling his fingers away on his burner account on Twitter to, you know, cook up new plays in the playbook. So, booyah. All right. <laughs> there you go. That's going to do it for us this week. Another Steelers loss and more disappointment is what Logan predicts. Hey. But I think that's reasonable. We march closer and closer to the toupee, baby. We yeah. march closer and closer. <laughs> Let's get some hair on that beautiful, shiny head. All right. So, Hope you guys enjoyed this one. As always, if you want more Nerd Sesh content, you can subscribe to the Volume YouTube page to get all of our shows there with video. You can listen to the podcast across audio platforms, and you can follow us on social media for clips from the show and, of course, our trivia content. That is at Nerd Sesh on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter at Nerd underscore Sesh. You can go cop some Nerd Sesh merch. We got the flags behind us. We've got hats. We've got hoodies. We've got shirts. All of that at thevolume.com and at the link tree in our social media bios where you can also join our discord if you want to talk football basketball be part of our community and check us out on cameo if you want any custom messages from the nerds so with that as always appreciate you guys enjoy the football this weekend i have been carson brabber i have been logan camden and this was nerd sesh